Well, I pretty much recovered from uh, Tuesday and uh, took a day off yesterday. So I thought I'd get back on and look at some of the things that I would consider lessons learned that we can draw from the election uh, still undecided as I record this Thursday morning at about 9.30. Uh, but what, what lessons can we draw from what happened on Tuesday night? I think the first thing we can draw from this is that the polls really suck. I mean, in many ways, assuming Biden wins, you can say at the macro level, the polls were right. They predicted virtually all of them that, that Biden would win. And he may yet. We don't, we don't know. Uh, looks a little less secure this morning for him than it did yesterday, but every day is a new day. So who can say? But at the micro level, I mean, the polls were really bad. I focused on Florida before in 2018. You know, they were off by seven in the governor's race. Well, guess what? They were off by about seven again in the presidential race. I don't think the polls have learned anything. Uh, one of the ones I would focus on was the uh, PINIAC poll. I don't even know why they should be in business anymore. I mean, they had Trump getting 39% of the popular vote in their last poll. Uh, you know, he, he was going to lose the popular vote. That's, that's to be sure. But he's, you know, he did almost 10 points better than that. This is, this is just ridiculous. And some of these other pollsters have been so wrong, especially in the state polls. There's one poll, I think Biden won by like 2%. Uh, one of the polls had went by 17. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I just don't see you know, anybody taking the polls seriously anymore. The same is true of the networks. I mean, they're just as bad. After all, they're usually the co-sponsors of these polls. And they're, they're pushing these polls and the, the likely results all the time. And they're just as bad as anything. And one of the things I've seen on social media is even among, you know, the people I, I interact with who are mostly like me and mostly conservatives and Republicans, they're even turning on Fox News. I mean, Fox News, I think, had a terrible night. They've had a whole a terrible, you know, going back to the Chris Wallace debacle in the first debate. But, you know, they didn't call Florida. Uh, just like all the others did. And that was absurd. I live in Florida. You know, I, I know, I know where, where the counties are. I know the panhandle. I know it comes in later because of the time zone things and stuff like that. But the idea, you know, Trump had a big lead in Florida. Most of the vote was in in the east. And what we were waiting on in the panhandle, which is this, you know, blood red out there. And, you know, you, you see Trump won those counties, you know, 60, 70, 75, you know, percent of the vote. There was no way votes were going to come in from the panhandle that were going to give Biden Florida. And yet they refused to call it. For hours this went on. And But, you know, at the same time, they're calling uh, Virginia and, 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 you know, calling it correctly. Trump had a big lead in Virginia and they called it for Biden. And I can understand why they did that. They know where the votes are and, you know, what's still coming in. And it turned out they were right. Virginia did ultimately go for Biden. Although when they called it, it didn't look anything like that. But they didn't call Florida. And, you know, just looking at Florida, and I know I used to live in Virginia, so I know somewhat about how the votes fall out there and what was likely to come in. And I can understand why they called Virginia when they did. But I couldn't understand why they didn't call Florida. And they all delayed, not just the other networks. It was even Fox News. I mean, what the hell are they waiting for? You know, I, I just don't get it. And, it, you know, it starts to look like conspiracy. And early on, I'm, I, and I was watching Fox News for the most part, I don't even get CNN. That's another story. But, you know, they said that, the, the, the you know, Nancy Pelosi was going to have a bigger majority in the House. That was just dead wrong. I mean, based on what? You know, how they were so far off. It turns out they actually, the Democrats lost several seats. And you know, I think it's four or five now. And it may get worse. Or maybe it get a little better. I don't know. But they certainly didn't carry, you know, a big surge in the House. And it was the same thing in the Senate. They may pick up one, maybe two seats. I don't know how, how that's all going to turn out. Uh, you know, we still don't know some of the races there yet. But this, this, I mean, there were, this, I got to the point where I couldn't stand Fox News. I mean, I actually had, I have, uh, I can put up two stations at once, listen to one audio. And I actually had Fox News and MSNBC on. And I started switching over to MSNBC just to see what they were saying. And of course, they weren't any better. But the, that's the whole point. They, they were, Fox was no better than MSNBC with its coverage as far as I was concerned. And I just didn't, you know, I just don't, it, I just, and I know I'm not the only one because I know a lot of people, uh, you know, are, are starting to get annoyed 
uh, with Fox News. And I think that's it's going to be even worse. I think mean, one of my lessons learned from Tuesday night is you're going to see even more people start turning their back on Fox News. I, I, and I'm one of them. Another thing that struck me looking at the electoral map as I was watching Tuesday night is how deeply divided this country is. I mean, if you look at the national map, there are a lot of states that are overwhelmingly red or blue. You know, you'll see a state come in, it's like 70% you know, for Biden, 30% for Trump. And it's another state 70% for Trump, 30% for Biden. And there's a lot of these states. And then if you start looking at the state maps and you look at the counties, you know, basically every state in the union, except maybe Hawaii, uh, it's the same thing. You've got these urban blue dots where, you know, in many states, it's more than half the people live. And I understand there's more people in these little blue dots surrounded by seas of red. And, you know, you look at a country map, it's it's the whole thing if you look at the county map. And I can't believe that that is healthy, that you have this big divide. Forget the politics of it all. Just a divide between, you know, slightly more than 50% of a population living in mostly urban areas and, you know, slightly less than 50% living in rural areas. And when you have several states on both sides. I mean, this is, to me, if if these were all located more geographically, like they were in 1860, North and South, we'd already be in a full-scale civil war. Uh, the only reason we're not is because it's, it's not geographically defined other than the rural-urban divide. And I don't know, you know how that works out, but it's not a good sign. So as I'm watching that map and just looking at it, and obviously it's been like this for a while, but it, it really hit me this is not a good sign, and it's not getting better. It didn't get better in the election of 2020. If anything, it got worse. It doesn't matter who wins. It's still the reality, and I think it's a bad reality, a negative reality, and a dangerous reality. Something else that struck me watching this is we've seen two more institutions basically destroyed. Two more institutions that have lost their legitimacy in the American mind. The first is the election process itself. I think at this point, it doesn't matter who wins. If, if Biden wins, I can see from what I'm seeing on Twitter, Facebook, I mean, people on the right, people who supported Trump are going to believe for the most part that it was stolen. That's it. And that's not a healthy situation in this country if half the people think they've been disenfranchised. If Trump wins, it's the same thing. I mean, the other half of the country is going to think that they were disenfranchised. That that's the reality. So no matter what, it doesn't matter how this ultimately works out. You're going to have half the people in this country no longer trust the electoral system. I think it was pretty bad after 2016, but it was mostly on the left. Now it's going to be mostly on the right. Even if Trump pulls this out and wins, there's still going to be a large scale belief on the right that the political system cannot be trusted. Our electoral system cannot be trusted. And that is really bad news. That's another nail into the coffin of, you know, burying this country right before we were dropped into a, the depths of a civil war. The other institution that I think has been destroyed through this whole electoral process is the judiciary, the idea of an independent judiciary. I was, I was watching TV the other night and, you know, everything coming out of Pennsylvania, well, it's a democratic court. At, which it is, because they're elected in Pennsylvania. But even looking at the Supreme Court, they were talking about how it might go, and, and the, they, they actually, and this is even on Fox News, they were calling the justices Democrat justices or Republican justices, based on who appointed them. And they're not supposed to be Democrat or Republican justices. Now, I'm not saying that they don't reflect Democrat and Republican politics. You can argue that they do, and you know, in many ways you'd be right. But if it's that bad and we don't even sort of maintain a fiction that it's that they're not partisan, it's another institution that's going down the drain. So if we can't trust uh, our elections and we can't trust our courts, you know, two more nails in that coffin. I mean, just, you know, drop us in the hole because... This is getting really bad and it's getting really serious. You know, institution after institution that provides some sort of consensus and holds us together, one by one, are being undermined 
destroyed. And there are people in this country who are proud of that destruction. It's part of their aim. It's part of their goal. Something else that's pretty clear to me is that, you know, even if the Democrats win the White House, uh, they really suffered other electoral defeats. They didn't take the Senate. I mean, you can't pack the Supreme Court without the United States Senate. And even though they control the House, they're probably going to have weaker control in the House and they can't raise taxes. They can't jack up the corporate tax without the Senate, even if they have the presidency. So in many ways, their goals in the election are going to be impossible to fulfill. And not only that, I mean, if you look at what happened with the Senate and the House and you think about the money they, I mean, they spent, you know, a hundred million dollars on some of these Senate races trying to get rid of uh, uh, Connell and people like that. And uh, the, the guy in Texas uh, uh, who won, Cora, they poured money into these races and they lost. And you have to wonder if they had spent that money and those resources and advertising and time and commercials, if they had spent that money supporting some of the House candidates who lost, if it wouldn't have been a wiser move. I mean, it was it worth, they didn't even get close with O'Connell. I mean, he still won pretty easily. I mean, he had a campaign harder, which sometimes he doesn't even have to do. Sure. But, you know, a hundred million bucks was the most expensive Senate campaign, I think, in U.S. history. And they lost by a lot. You know, how much more could they have done in these House races? If they put their resources there. But, you know, they wanted to go after the Senate and they obviously wasted a lot of money and ran some people who really uh, were flawed candidates. I mean, uh, Tom Tillis should have lost in North Carolina. I mean, the guy's under his, you know, ethics cloud. But they ran somebody against him who's under a bigger ethics cloud. And they didn't know any of these things. They didn't vet this guy. There's nobody else in North Carolina. They could have, they could have run against him. I mean, they could have found another Harvey Gantt who they used to run, you know, back in the '90s against uh, uh, whatever his name was, the the old white guy who was in the Senate from North Carolina, Republican. You know, something like Harvey Gantt would have just chewed up Tom Tillis. And they, they don't have a, a decent candidate they could put up, black or white, in North Carolina to run against Tillis. It just, it's just, I don't get it. Uh, and, and I think that's another lesson. That, you know, they, they may end up winning the White House, or they may not. But even if they do, what can they do? with their, what's, what, How do they push their agenda without the Senate? How do they push their agenda with a smaller number of seats in the House? And remember, in two years, there's going to be another round of elections. And we know what happened to the Democrats in 2010 after they won in 20, 2008. So if Biden does win, you know, they may lose more ground in the by-elections in uh, 2022. They may lose a couple more Senate seats. They may lose control of the House. Who knows what's going to happen? So, so th they've got some real problems. And I think for them, that, that's another lesson. You know, they, they, they may yet win the White House. But if they also lose the White House and Trump's elected, and they don't take the Senate, and they lost ground in the House, then they're really in bad shape. I guess what you could say that the lessons I drew, you know, when I, Tuesday night, and my, my two main themes and my two main playlists are, you know, we've been the election and a coming civil war. I've been talking about civil war coming for three years. If everything I saw that's happened Tuesday night and since Tuesday night leads me to believe, you know, we've taken not just one, we've taken several steps closer to full scale conflict in this country. And that's scary and it's troubling. And I don't see how that's going to change. I mean, whatever, however this election turns out, people are going to be more polarized. I mean, roughly half the population is going to be pissed, no matter who ends up winning. And they're going to be more pissed than they were the last time. If Biden wins, I mean, the Biden people are still pissed. That's why they voted against Trump. And the other thing is now the Republicans are going to be pissed. The Republicans are going to be like the resistance. The Republicans are going to be the people, you know, posting screaming videos. Well, they won't go that far, but being part of the resistance. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of pressure, especially if Trump wins. You know, social media. I mean, social media has just been terrible. I mean, I've been hammered on, especially Twitter. I've lost about 100 uh, followers. I, I put things up. It's like nobody. I know I'm being shadow banned. I can tell. And I'm getting hammered there. I'm getting hammered in Facebook. I've been threatened. They're starting to shut down my account. 
Uh, I, I haven't been bothered on YouTube. I think it's because I'm too small. You know, I, I have a, today I had 101 subscribers, at least in the morning. I don't know what I got now. And I think I fly under the radar of their algorithm. I know I don't get bothered. I'm not monetized, so they, they can't threaten me or demonetize me to put pressure on me or anything like they do with, with bigger accounts. But, and I'm, you know, I think I fly under the radar on YouTube, so I don't seem to get bothered there. But, you know, Facebook's pretty bad and Twitter's the worst, the worst. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's not good. And, and, you know, people are getting really agitated. And like I said before, they can't silence it. They're like putting a toll booth on one lane and the other lanes are just going through and everything's getting around them. All they're doing really is annoying people. And they're not really stopping the news from moving. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. We'll see how, how that all plays out. But it's, none of that's a good sign. You're just getting people to believe. I mean, you're convincing more and more people, roughly half a population in this country, that the political system just worked against them, that, you know, they can't trust uh, the deep state, no matter who's in charge. They can't trust the electoral system. They don't trust the judicial system. They can't trust the media. They can't trust social media. You know, this is, is what destroys the consensus in this country. And the consensus is what holds us together. You know, we're not held together, as I've said many times, by ethnicity, by religion, even by language. We're held together, held together by adherence to a set of political ideas and assumptions, a national consensus made up of different parts. And as you destroy the individual parts, the institutions, the beliefs, the understandings of that consensus. There's no reason for the country to remain together. Uh, right now, I think the only thing that holds this country together is simple inertia. And inertia will maintain it until there's some sort of spark. I don't know what that big spark is going to be, but sooner or later it's going to happen. And once it's triggered, it's going to be over. And we will be in a really bloody civil war. As I've said many times, uh, re-quoting uh, John Shy, the Amer Americans are people numerous and armed, and they are dangerous. Just ask the British. And one last point. I think it's, it's, it, it's very important, and I don't always see it being made. You know, Joe Biden, whether he wins or loses, uh, I think he got like 70, 70 over 70 million votes. Joe Biden got more votes than Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden got more votes than Barack Obama in his big win, 2008. Millions more votes. I think something like 10 or 11 million more people voted in this election on both sides than voted four years ago. That's an incredible increase. And it just goes to show you, you know, in one hand, one way, it's good. You know, more people are voting, more people care. Turnout or percentage of people coming out to vote is a good thing. The problem is they're still split. And as more people are voting, what's the sign is that more people are interested and more people, you know, more people are, see politics as important. And given the divisions, that just heightens tensions in the country. So in one way, it's a really good sign. The other way, it's a really bad sign. And you need to understand that Donald Trump, for all whatever his perceived flaws are, whatever said against him, you know, Donald Trump got more votes. Even if he loses, he'll have gotten more votes than Hillary Clinton did in 2016. Now, you could say he prompted more Democrats to go out and vote against him, too. And that, that's, that's true, which is that's one of his problems. But the idea that he's losing support in this country is just not true. What he's doing is he's motiv motivating more people to vote on both sides. And, you know, I don't think, I mean, that's a good sign if you're a Republican, certainly a good sign in Florida, where they, the state's looking redder and redder the last couple of elections. But it, I don't think it's a good sign if you're looking at the political health of this country, that more people are interested, but they're still divided and they're more agitated on both sides. You know, it's, it's, you have more activists today. You have more people who care, but since they're divided, that means they care about things that are dividing the country. And it's just another, you know, yet another nail in the lid of a coffin before it gets dropped in. 
So what do you think? Let me know in a comment. If you can, give a video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. And until the next time, keep fighting.